So many of you have heard about the work that we've been doing with the, with the GRACE uh, mission. And GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. It was launched in 2002. And it really does work like a scale um, in the sky um, in that uh, water's super heavy. When there's more of it on the ground, it creates a greater gravitational attraction and a greater pull on these two satellites, which are not very big. They're about the size of, each about the size of a squashed minivan. And they're up about 400 kilometers. And when a region loses water weight, um, then there's less of a gravitational tug and the satellites float just a little bit higher uh, in their orbit. Uh, so um, I like to think of it as a scale, but it's one that works at a relatively coarse resolution. Thank you. How is that? Is that better? I'll stand really close. My wife always tells me basically just like do this. Uh, um, so, but, I, but I won't. Uh, so anyway, it works at a fairly coarse resolution, monthly time scales, uh, and large areas, 150,000 square kilometers and greater, which is pretty big. That's about the size of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River basins together. It's about the size of uh, Southern, Southern California. Um, oh, yes, there they are, the, the two men in their bunny suits. Um, so Grace tells us um, the change, the delta, in the total amount of water, so all of the snow all of the surface water, all the soil moisture, and all of the groundwater. So the delta, the, the monthly change for big river basins and uh, uh, quite a schematic, uh, schematic here. Uh, it's, getting, you know, it's getting on there in years. It's um, again launched in 2002. It was supposed to be a five-year mission. Batteries are dying. We're collecting about nine months of data now per year. Sometimes we miss the key months like uh, the peak uh, storage in the winter, and the or maybe the lowest storage uh, at the end of the end of the growing season. Uh, but help is on the way uh, in the form of the follow-on, the Grace follow-on or Grace FO, and it will launch at the end. It's the same mission, won't be improved resolution. It's called a climate continuation mission, and so that's going to launch in in 2017. So following on this idea of uh, the coarseness, I show this animation so you can see, right? It's not like what we're used to seeing when we think about satellite Landsat data, or if any of you looked at any of the NASA soil moisture data or some of these other data, they're very high resolution. So it's not the case with, with GRACE. But, but that said, we learned a tremendous amount of things about what's happening with the world's water resources. And this is um, a map of the trends of freshwater uh, availability um, uh, globally, and the blues are gaining water and the, and the reds are losing water, and all of the major trends are labeled there. The biggest trends are the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica melting away, and, and the glaciers in Alaska and Patagonia, but a lot of those other red spots are actually aquifers. Uh, so Central Valley, High Plains, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, North China Plain, all, all over the world. And so uh, in terms of impacting policy, this work has really resonated uh, at a very high level and at a very low level with the general public, high level, say, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, oh, to follow up on this uh, idea of the, uh, the aquifers, this is a study that Sasha Ritchie did. Sasha's here. She has a talk on Thursday at 1020. Uh, but this just takes... Uh, this map and basically maps it to the major aquifers of the world. And so we can see um, the stress and the rates of depletion that are happening in over the half of the world's major aquifers. So we're able to do a lot of large scale stuff. In, in California, we can sort of drill down and look at a time series. So look at the ups and downs, the monthly ups and downs of uh, total water storage. And hang on, hang on. I burned a hole in my hand with that laser. Just wanted to share that with you. Uh, so wet season, dry season, wet season, dry season, starting 2002, going through about November. Um, so, you know, you can see a few things. You can see the sort of grace version of the drought map, the, the dry seasons getting drier. You can see the rates of decline of total water storage from grace. Um, uh, not only in the drought, but really sort of going on for long periods of time, which really points to, it's really underlain by the groundwater depletion, which we show here in a combination plot with data from the USGS and Claudia's report uh, from 2009. I know it's been updated, but we stuck the GRACE data here on the end to show 
right? It sort of continues that trend. Uh, we see the long-term decline of the groundwater and the colors in the background represent wet periods versus dry periods. So you see the blues are wet, blue and light blue are wetter, brown and light brown are drier. So you see a little recovery in the wet periods and then of course the big decline during long-term depletion that we all know uh, about. And uh, you know we can share images like this which really resonate with the public. Um, but there's not a lot of scientific uh, information here, not a lot that we can do with respect to water management. So just a summary on sort of water policy and management accomplishments to date. The India paper that we wrote in 2009 had a huge impact uh, and led directly to the national hydrogeological groundwater mapping uh, that's going on there according to the Ministry of Water Resources. The California paper and the follow-on work that we've done uh, was a key contribution to justifying the need for, for SEGMA, and that's according to the, the State Water Board. Um, the NASA climate architecture document um, uh, uh, spells out that both of those, the California and the India work, are key justifications for, for actually selecting this this GRACE mission, uh, the follow-on mission. Emissions are competitive, so uh, it's nice to, to be recognized like that. But all that said, you know, the physics of doing time variable gravity are just such that we're never gonna get down to anything below about 50,000 square kilometers, okay? So that means that we have to do, if we wanna, so, so what are we left with? We're left with some high resolu higher resolution GRACE mission that may launch in about 2025 or later. And until then, we probably wanna combine it with other data. So how are we gonna do this downscaling to enhance the utility of GRACE data for water management? Well, we could combine with GPS and INSAR. Michelle showed some of that stuff before, uh, or some GPS and some INSAR. This is a chart that shows GRACE time series in uh, maroon, and then a GPS uh, uh, time series in, in blue. So there's a lot of correspondence there. The difference is shown in green. You know, we're working on trying to figure out why those differences are there and how we can use the, uh, you know, there's a bazillion GPS stations out there that could give us a lot of temporal, uh, enhance the temporal frequency. So that's something that we're working on. INSAR, Michelle showed some of the subsidence maps, and this is one from Upper El Nido. Uh, so, uh, Again, combining those either with each other, just analyzing the data jointly, or combining in some kind of a model would be very useful. So speaking of combining into models, we can take GRACE data, we can assimilate it or combine it with models. This is a chart from, from Matt Rodell. It shows a simulation of winter and summer water storage. Uh, the GRACE data assimilated at the very large scale shown on the left, and then you let the model run at a higher resolution to uh, distribute the information uh, within, the, within the larger area. Um, and then there's what uh, Michelle has been working on, which is using neural networks to, to do the downscaling. So let me show you some of her uh, recent results. And so the idea is to go from something like this uh, and blow it up, uh, to something like this, where this is a four kilometer, uh, uh, four kilometer resolution. So you're taking about a one degree and splitting it up into uh, uh, one kilometer, sorry, four kilometer resolution. So that would be wonderful if we could do that. Um, and and so the approach that she's been taking is neural networks, and there's some advantages. Uh, to neural networks. They're great for using with uh, densely populated data sets and noisy data sets. Uh, they consist of machine learning, and uh, so some of the advantages are the machine learning, the speed, the flexibility, and they're pretty robust. They're actually used more than you think. For example, Facebook uses it for, for facial uh, recognition. Our colleagues at uh, UCI um, use neural, a neural network approach to downscale, <coughs> excuse me, satellite precipitation data. So they have the coarse satellite data and they use ground-based precipitation uh, stations to, to train the neural network and, and, uh, and do a great job uh, with it. So uh, that's the basic idea is you go from um, inputs, which I'll show you in a second, to some training and then some, out and some outputs. Um, so in our case, we'll be using GRACE data and other hydrologic variables, maybe uh, ground-based data, well data on the ground, uh, slope, soil type, DEM information. Um, and so we train, uh, 
train the model, we have some calibration data, we have some uh, validation data, and we try to estimate the weights or optimize the weights and, um, and come up with some, uh, some relationship that's gonna give us higher resolution groundwater maps. So uh, schematically, that's about the scale we're talking about, right, for GRACE data, the scale, the, the box. And so, you know, we'd have like basically one number for this box, and so we want to train it with, in this case, we're looking at annual data, by the way. So uh, here's some annual observations of changes uh, in groundwater levels, input data streams here, uh, thousands of wells that we're using for for calibration. Um, and these are just what some results look like. So we've gone from about the scale of that box to uh, the bigger box uh, would be one number uh, to the detail that we see within, uh, within the frame. Uh, so there's Modesto and Merced for, uh, uh, for uh, location. And so that's uh, storage change in the year 2008. Here it is in 2009. Uh, here it is in 2010. Uh, so again, we're going from uh, something like this to something like this by using this sort of uh, information on the on the ground. Uh, cal you know, this is work in progress. I think the calibration and, and validation is going pretty well. You can see some of the uh, numbers here uh, for validation. Um, so we're still working, or Michelle is still working on it, and I'm cheering her on. Uh, madly. Um, and just let me close with um, some things that we're doing at JPL along the same lines. One of them is called the Western States Water Mission, which is a, a model based on scaling like I showed you for the Mississippi, but we're doing it for the Western United States at three kilometer resolution. It will include GRACE data as well as some other NASA satellite data in the assimilation. And um, this may be of interest to uh, agencies and, and water districts who are here. We're just firing up what we're calling the Western States, uh, sorry, Western Water Applications Office at WWAO. And the goal of the WWAO WAO, is to uh, match stakeholder needs to uh, NASA capabilities. And you know we haven't really traditionally done a great job of doing that, and NASA headquarters has recognized that. So. Um, uh, that's one of the things we're going to do. Another thing is, is try to get NASA data into the hands of decision makers, make the data more accessible. We recognize how difficult uh, they can be to use. Um, and so we're trying to circumvent some of that. So if you have any questions about the modeling or the water office, please ask me. More generally, you could uh, contact Michelle or myself for more information on this presentation. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. I enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm wondering what you think or project the prospects might be for downscaling the GRACE data to such high resolution in areas that have are generally more data scarce, such as India. Yeah, I think it's more of a challenge, right? I mean, to really do the downscaling, the kind, at least the kind of downscaling that we're talking about, you really need the information on the ground. Uh, now, that being said, you know, there are other satellite data that are out there that may help. So, uh, you know, maybe INSAR data will help if there's GPS data. And some of the other global missions that I didn't talk about, but like the Soil Moisture Active Passive mission, the SMAP mission, the SWAT mission, Surface Water and Ocean Topography that will launch in, in 2020. Those, those, could be, those could be of help. Other questions? So this may not be related to downscaling, but you, uh, can you comment on the article today in Washington Post <laughs> about the <laughs> discovery? It's just a matter of time. Uh, so do you mean the uh, Kang and Jackson paper on, right? So, well, yeah. So, uh, there's a paper uh, published in PNAS and said that, uh, you know, we have like 50 million bazillion more acre feet of, uh, of, of deep groundwater. Uh, so my comment is, problem solved, we should go to the bar. Uh, no, no, I've t so Rob is, is an old friend. So the good aspects of that paper are that they're, you know, keeping attention on the fact that we really don't have a good understanding, not only in California, but at many of the world's major aquifers how much groundwater we have and how its quality changes with depth. Uh, so that part is good. It's great that they used oil and gas wells. But, you know, the part about there being so much more fresh water, I think, 
uh, you know, having done that kind of work, I mean, this is what Sasha did in her, in one of her major papers, who did an assessment of all those sorts of empirical studies. And what you find is that they're just all over the place. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's any reason to, uh, I don't think there's too much scientific merit to, to that one.